and your currency is going to be your relationships with those journalists. So when they're looking for something to write about, you know, they're not just going to go on the internet and Google it. They're going to go into their contact list and be like, you know what, that girl has given me some good story material before. I'm just going to email her and see what's going on with that. Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I'm joined by my dear friend, Summer Bozeman, who is a writer here in Savannah, Georgia, amongst other things. So to start out the episode, I would like you to just tell everyone who you are and what you do. Hi, everyone. Uh, My name is Summer Bozeman. I'm a communications professional and freelance writer. Okay. And uh, did you go to school for that? I did. I studied PR in college. And when you were 17 or 18, uh, is that what you knew you wanted to do at that point? No, not really. Um, I started out as an education major. I feel like as a lot of people might do. Um, A lot of my friends were education majors. And I grew up in a small town where... um, I guess, I I don't know if I had a lot of ideas at first. And um, I started out as an education major and then I went to department orientation and they were talking about how rigorous the program was. And I was like, I don't think I want to be a teacher. I don't think I want to do this. Um, So I just started doing core classes and started figuring out exactly what I wanted to do. And initially I wanted to work in entertainment. I wanted to work as... um, like an A&R agent for a record label back when record labels were still a thing. And um, just thought, well, I'm, I'm just going to try and get a general communications degree and see where that goes. So so in entertainment and education? No. I was like, I don't want to do education, but I'm, I don't want to change my major yet until I, f- I figure out exactly how I'm going to make this happen. So um, I started taking my core classes that I could apply to whatever degree I ended up in and um, ended up in communications and... I think that was the right decision. I definitely wouldn't have been a good teacher. What are some of the little, like, stepping stones that landed, that pointed you in that direction? Um, I was really interested in music, and I was finding a lot of music on the internet back in 2002. Kazaa and... Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. LimeWire, Lime mm-hmm. and um, listening to a lot of stuff that my friends weren't listening to. Again, small town, so um, not a whole lot of... Uh, media diversity and um finding stuff and introducing it to my friends my boyfriend was a musician so um introducing stuff to him and he was sharing stuff with me and so i I just had a lot of interest in um going somewhere bigger and doing something a little bit more just a little different i don't i don't know what made me think i was going to be a teacher um did you have one in the family uh no Um, I think what it was, uh, was I was a competitive cheerleader in high school and, um, was going to do that in college. That was, uh, going to be my scholarship plan, but girls don't often get competitive cheerleading scholarships. Um, I was hoping that I would get one and I thought, well, maybe I can, you know, get my books paid for or something. Um, so that was kind of my job in high school was go to practice and do the best I can and, um, try to get a scholarship and, I didn't get a scholarship. I did get a walk-on onto a good team. And um, I think I was thinking I would be a teacher and a coach. But I really wanted to be a coach. I didn't really want to be a teacher. So I've known you for a couple of years, and I still have trouble getting it straight because you have family from Georgia, Alabama, Florida. Mm-hmm. You've also lived, you've, you've lived in Macon. You've lived outside of Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Kind of like help me straighten that all out. You also mm-hmm. went, went down and lived in St. Augustine. Mm-hmm. So well, how did that progression, where did you move around? And- okay, um, I was born in Tampa, Florida, which is kind of in the middle, well, on the halfway down the peninsula on the Gulf Coast side. Um, but I didn't have family there. My mom's family is from Pensacola, which is as far west on the panhandle as you can get. And my dad's family was in Jacksonville, which is as far east on the panhandle as you could get. And um, uh, mom's family, like Pensacola is right on the state line between Florida and that little tiny tip of Alabama that people don't 
notice because it's just this little tiny little piece. That... I didn't know Georgia had a coast, let alone Alabama, well, until I moved here, of course. Alabama has a very, very small coast, and um, uh, our, her family had been in Alabama for generations, and it just kind of migrated a little bit over towards Pensacola. And um, uh, there were some family stories about, um, uh, you know, French ancestors from uh, coming from the Caribbean, from the French colonies in the Caribbean who ended up in Pensacola. And so that, that little area right there of West Florida and what they call Lower Alabama uh, was where her family was from. And um, my, my parents both lived in Florida and they met on a blind date. And they kind of picked Tampa because it was sort of in the middle. And um, they both worked for a, a bank. They worked for Barnett Bank, and there was a branch. There were branches in Tampa, so that's how they ended up there. I was born there, and we lived there for a couple of years. And we moved to the suburbs outside of Atlanta, and lived there for a couple of years uh, uh, until my dad got laid off, and um, he was out of work for a couple of years. And took a job in Macon, which is right in the very middle of the state. Um, it was a lot more rural than we were used to from the Atlanta suburbs. And um, I went to the one high school in the whole county, which was a pretty big county in terms of, you know, like land area. But um, it was pretty sparsely populated, so... It was a pretty small school, and it was culture shock, and, um... And you were effectively, like, an only child, too. Yeah, uh, my dad had two kids from his first marriage, but they were 14 and 18 when I was born. Um, and my sister lived with us for a couple of years when we were in Tampa, but uh, she eventually, uh, moved out and lived with her mom. She joined the Navy, so she was, she was pretty much gone. And my brother, I don't, I don't really remember him living with us. I think he might have lived with us for a little while but so is there some common um bond or some similarities you find between other writers and like their backgrounds and your background yeah um i think that a lot of writers tend to be empathetic people um and i think a lot of writers also tend to be only children or, or are raised as only children like i was like i read a lot of books i was by myself all the time um, I was never really into video games like other kids of my generation were. And, um, you know, like I didn't really play card games or board games because I was by myself. So uh, I read a lot. And um, I remember writing stories as a kid, you know, like I'd read something and be inspired to write something like it. And so I just had um, like white printer paper. We, we had a lot of it for some reason. I, I think it was where my dad was working because I remember it had a watermark on it. But um, when the layoff happened, he's like, all right, right. <laughs> he's like, let me, let me get all this paper. I don't know. But um, we had a whole lot of, of copier paper. Like I remember s cabinets full of it. And I would just write longhand on this unlined copier paper. And um, I, I wish I still had that stuff, but I have no idea where any of that would be. But I, I do remember writing stories that were inspired by the things that I was reading as a kid who was kind of isolated. So you're um, working as a cheer coach in high school. You're getting towards graduation. Mm -hmm. And how do you land on the particular program you landed up for, for? In college? Yeah. Uh, they were, they were going to win nationals the next year. They were, like, I think they had gotten um, a half-point deduction that had kept them from the title. So they had gotten second place, and they deserved first place. And, um... Mm -hmm. It was an all-girl team. I had been on a co-ed team in high school and um, just wanted to, to do something different. Um, you know, I was kind of over the boys and um, over, the, over the drama. And I was like, I'm just going to go be on a team with 33 girls. And um, uh, that was a different experience. Um, it was a much bigger team. There were 33 people. There were a lot more people than I was used to. And um, there wasn't like a, like a first string, second string. There wasn't like an A team, B team. But um, there was a lot of competition because there are only going to be 20 people who get to be on the mat, as they say a lot of people have 
watched that cheer documentary on Netflix now and they know the lingo. Uh, but there are only going to be 20 people on the floor. So, um, and as a freshman, you know, like I was not high in the ranking. Uh, also a lot of the girls knew each other. They came from private gyms in the Atlanta area and I didn't. So, um, I felt like I was starting kind of behind everybody else. This is at Flagler? No, this is, uh, at Kennesaw State. Okay. Um, I only went to Kennesaw State because of their cheer team. And, um, I, uh, I had created a video, um, a tryout video for the National Cheerleaders Association staff. I'd been invited to try out for their staff. And, um, I thought, well, I can, I can make this video, my tryout video for Kennesaw and, um, then maybe I won't have to actually go and try out in person. And, and I was right. I didn't have to. I got to walk on onto the team. And I think being on NCA staff had a lot to do with that. Because um, at least at that time, you had to be invited to try out for staff. Like you could download an application on the internet, but it was white. It was on copy paper. And if you got invited, it was a blue application. And it had a head instructor's signature on it. So um, I think being able to say that I'd gotten... I'd, been invited to try out and then gotten onto staff played a big role in getting onto this national championship team and um they actually did win nationals that that next year i had transfer schools wasn't on the team then so i can't say that i won nationals but they did and i was on that team i gotta walk on you laid the foundation i totally did it was it was all me so um did you ever think like i'm gonna go to school to be an author like to be a writer or do you specifically think like I want to do PR but writing helps basically enforce that and make you a stronger PR person I didn't really think that I could make money as a writer um I do remember a a counselor once as a child um asking me what do you want to be when you grow up and I said I want to be a writer and she laughed and said oh no honey what do you want to do to make money and apparently that stuck with me because I thought I can't make money as a writer like how do you do that? Like, do you, you write novels? Do you, um, get a job at a magazine? Or I knew I didn't want to be a journalist because I'm, you may laugh when I say this, but I'm not confrontational enough. I don't want to ask those uncomfortable questions. You know, I don't want to make other people uncomfortable. So I was like, I'm, I can't do that. I can't handle that. But, um, uh, working in PR, you know, there's, um, a big writing element and, um, uh, PR, goes hand in hand with journalism it's kind of a partnership so I'm like well that's journalism adjacent but I get to be a little bit softer I get to be a little bit nicer about it you find the spin it's not just we don't say spin right you're doing it we don't say spin um but you know I get to tell stories is what what PR really is um and usually representing somebody so it's mostly positive right well you're you're trying to tell a positive story your message is going to be a positive story and um you know there's lots of other components to pr there's you know crisis management which is a big one and that's a whole different profession that some people go into and like that's something you you need to be capable of but i was like i don't know that's scary that's not stressful i'm i just want to represent something that i believe in and tell those stories and get get those stories out to everyone else so what kinds of things are you passionate about writing about or because I know there's a lot uh well you know what's interesting is as a younger person when I was making those decisions I didn't really have a lot of those passions or really even interests I guess as a younger person I I uh, didn't really know who I was or what I wanted to do um I guess, as I briefly mentioned, when I was trying to decide on a major, I was like, I guess I'm going to be a teacher because, you know, I like, I like coaching. I like cheerleading. I, you know, um, I knew that I was at least competitive enough that I wanted to do competitive cheer. Like, I wasn't interested in sidelining. I, I cheered for football for many, many years, and I still couldn't tell you a thing about the game. Um, I could not have been less interested in sideline cheer, and I would be annoyed when, um, like, we'd have to go to the playoffs, and there was a game late on Friday night all the way across the state, and we have to go to competition at 7 o'clock in the morning. Like, we need our sleep. But um, I think uh, it was during those kind of formative college years that I started thinking, what what kind of things do I think? What kind of things do I feel and believe in? And what kind of things matter to me? Um, 
and I guess being exposed to other ideas and um, just other other kinds of thought. I remember I took an editing and layout class, um, which was a required course for my major, and that teacher required us to subscribe to the New York Times, and every week we would have a current events quiz, and it was it was like a hard quiz. Like, you know, she was asking us obscure information from the back of the paper, you know, like dollar amounts of obscure bills that were going through Congress. Like we had to really read the paper and really understand what we were reading. And I think that had, you know, a pretty significant impact on the kinds of things that I was thinking about. Because I, I probably would not have read the New York Times front to back multiple times a week if I had not been forced to. But now I do. Now I, I still subscribe to the New York Times. Um, I think of writing like similar to video in that in and of itself, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, you shoot videos or produce videos or podcasts to tell a story Mm -hmm. and writing is also just a conduit for whatever else you're doing in life Mm -hmm. or, you know, whether that's career wise or personal. Um, so really like what we do is the same but in a different medium exactly and i think there are a lot of different kinds of writing um npr there are a lot of different kinds of writing that you have to do you know a press release is very um just facts ma'am and straightforward and no adjectives and there's a format and it's you know like it's something that you learn how to do it's a skill that you acquire as simple as it seems to be but then also um if you're writing a feature story, you know, that is really creative writing and it can be good or bad, you know, um, objectively. Um, I think if I were going into writing something like a feature story, I have an idea of how I want it to feel, you know, how I kind of hesitate to say how I want the reader to feel as they're going through it, but I have an idea of how I want the tone to land and then kind of mold it like clay as as I'm working on it. And I think with creative writing, I do that too. I know how I want it to feel. And I don't know what the words are going to be until they're on the page. And I'm like, no, that's not quite it. You know, kind of go back and start over again. But I think it's kind of an emotional process. It's good because you're attached to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it's also hard because Mm -hmm. I know that you'll write something and then you'll cross it all out and you'll write it again. I do. I, I do that a lot. Um, find your voice, find that emotion. Mm -hmm. A lot of times I get done and think that it doesn't feel like it's supposed to feel. It just, it's flat. And maybe it's not flat to someone else, but it's not, it doesn't live up to the idea that I had in my head. I heard a quote too that uh, from a writer, I I was in a screenwriting class and my teacher said like, don't be a writer if you can do anything else. Mm -hmm. So it's like only Mm -hmm. if you are compelled to mm-hmm. pursue this as a as a career yeah. or as a passion, right? Um, then do it. Otherwise, you're not going to be successful because... Right. Yeah. Well, and, and it's also so... I mean, there's such a spectrum. You know, what's good writing, what's bad writing? You know, you and I probably have different ideas about what's good and what's bad, and, um, and that's normal, you know? Um, I know I'm bad, but... <laughs> I don't think you're bad. Um, uh, As I talk to other people who are not professional writers, but are good writers, you know, um, we often have similar ideas of, is this good or is this bad? Uh, But, you know, Faulkner. Faulkner. I mean, some people love Faulkner. Some people, Steinbeck is, is my real sticking point. Some people live for Steinbeck and I have tried Steinbeck so many times. I just don't like Steinbeck. And, um, who do you, who do you like? Who are some other people that you look up to? Um, Flannery O'Connor, who's a great Southern writer. Savannah native. Yes. Um, she was born in Savannah. She didn't live here very long though. She lived in Milledgeville, which is outside of Macon. Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> um uh oh gosh other great writers um i or I journalists can, um 
there is um, a really great current writer named Dan Jones. He is a writer and a historian, and he's also a TV presenter. Um, he lives in London, and um, he's written a whole bunch of really nerdy history books that I'm really, really into. And, um, you know, he's presented a lot of, like, BBC documentaries, documentary series, you know, like, episodic kind of stuff, which is very light, but also, you know, it's the kind of stuff that I just go home and turn on and that's what I listen to, you know, when I'm by myself. So journalists will knock the PR people for having no sense of uh, journalistic integrity. And we haven't really touched on your passion for history yet. Mm -hmm. Um, But I know you as a person are very into the facts and conveying things the way they, you know, fact checking and making sure all your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed, which is an interesting segue to the fact that you're a published history author yes i am could you talk about how that came to be what the name of your book and uh how that process played out yeah um well i um i left kennesaw state university and i went to flagler college in saint augustine florida which was much smaller and um private um which sounds bougie but it's not it was actually cheaper than kennesaw and um It's in a historic Gilded Age hotel that's, like, two miles from the beach. So there were were a lot of positives. It's beautiful there. It's so beautiful. The town, the campus. Exactly. Like, I was going from Kennesaw, which is, um, you know, a very, uh, it's a cookie-cutter suburb of Atlanta, and I didn't didn't like it at all. I was at, um, you know, a, a big university with, like, I don't know how many students there were, like 25,000 students. You know, I was in classes with 250 people. And um, I was kind of gravitating away from being on that team. And so I kind of didn't really have anybody. And I was like, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I don't like the school. I don't like the town. I think I need to do something that's a little bit more aligned with what I think I might actually like. So um, Flagler was actually not my idea initially. One of my friends from high school was going there and um, encouraged me to apply. And at the time, I I had, I'm going off on a tangent here, I had the Hope Scholarship, which um, is a Georgia Lottery-funded program for state schools. If if you maintain a B average, then your tuition and fees are paid at a public university. So my tuition and fees were paid at Kennesaw, um, but I was really unhappy there. So I um, wanted to go to Flagler, which was out of state, and my parents were going to have to pay for it. I was going to have to take out a loan, and I knew it was going to be a fight because my parents are, you know, um, I have really great, really supportive parents, and they didn't want me to start life in debt. So it was really important to them that I did not take out loans, but they also didn't, you know, want to pay tuition if they didn't have to. So... Um, that was kind of the first time that I ever disagreed with my parents. And um, The book, the book. And uh, so I went to Flagler College, um, and it was absolutely the right decision. My parents were totally wrong, um, and I loved it so much there. Um, I loved the, the, the city, which is um, America's oldest continuously inhabited settlement. Um, it was founded by the Spanish in 1565. Ponce de Leon. Uh, Ponce de Leon, um, quote, discovered Florida in 1513, but nobody came back until 1565. And the city was actually founded by Pedro Menendez de Avales. And <laughs> so um, as I was graduating from Flagler, I knew I was going to have to move away to look for work. And um, I was graduating in 2007, which was a really crappy time to be looking for a job, especially in a non-revenue producing field like PR. So I was, I was even looking for unpaid internships and not getting any calls. And I thought I need to fluff my resume a little bit and um, was also thinking about how sad I was to leave St. Augustine. And I had bought one of those like trade paperback kind of um, tourist focused books and was um just walking around town looking at the pictures of the old buildings and what they look like now and I thought I'd like to make a scrapbook like this before I leave and I thought hey maybe somebody would buy that um 
so I thought I'm going to make a pitch to a publisher and um, the book that I was looking at was by Arcadia Publishing and it turned out that they actually had a book series in that vein called the Then and Now series. So um, I just reached out to an editor and um, uh, said I'd really like to write the Then and Now book for St. Augustine. And so you just like called the number in the back of the book or I like I, um, Googled Arcadia Publishing? I, I went to their website and they uh, at the time it was really easy to just they had like regional acquisition editors and I just sent the guy an email and um, said, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about writing this book. And um, he said, I would love for you to pitch it to me. They had like a packet, like a pitch packet where they asked a lot of specific questions and they wanted some examples of what I would want to do and how I would organize it. So I um, had maybe a week or two weeks to, to fill out that packet and make my pitch and they liked my ideas. So um, I signed a contract, and um, then I had a deadline, a contractual deadline, and uh, right as soon as I started the research, my computer crashed, and I was very poor and could not afford to buy another one, and was freaking out, and um, my sweet, long-suffering parents, you know, went to, like, Circuit City, which was going out of business, and they bought me, like, a $250 laptop, because, you know, we're, we're all in in that kind of a financial situation. My, my poor sweet dad was like, I, I got you this. And I'm like, thank you, it'll it do. It can do word processing. It's, it's all I need, that's all I need. So, um, and my mom actually really helped a lot with the book. Um, the concept is um, historic photos and I had to um, narrow it down to like a certain era. And I focused on um, between like the 1870s and 1890s and um, went to find those historic photos and had to get the the rights to use them and pay for them and then you know get the rights to use them for one-time publishing and um had to keep a job at the same time i was working like 50 hours a week in a business i really 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 hated and uh, so my mom came and stayed with me for a while and um, i would give her a list of topics that i i needed her to help me research and um she would go and pull photos for me and i would call through them and, and pick the ones that I liked the best and then um, went around town and just took like 35 millimeter um, shots of those photos recreated from as close film film yeah. they, they wanted film um, I, had, I had to buy a camera I bought like a $50 Nikon on eBay and um, was trying to recreate those shots from from the same angle and so um, I was like crawling through bushes and climbing up walls and laying on top of the wall. So did you mail them the negatives or did you have to? I had to mail the negatives. Oh, okay. They wanted the prints. Um, so funny. Yeah, they wanted the prints and the negatives, I think. Uh, but yeah, so uh, that's how that happened. And um, How long did that take? It was a pretty quick turnaround. I think I only had like two months to get it done oh wow yeah it was a super and i mean it was a contract and i was working a lot and um the historical society which owned all the photos was only open like on wednesday and saturday you know for four hours a day so um it was it was tough but um my mom helped a lot and um and i'm really glad that i did that and you were a published author. You've been a published author. Uh, yeah, as you know, a new college grad with like no experience in anything. So that I think that that did really help me to to get calls back initially as a new grad during that time when I wasn't getting any calls. So can people still find this book? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, it's at ArcadiaPublishing.com, or you can find it on Amazon or BarnesandNoble.com. It's called Then and Now. It's Saint Augustine. Uh, then and Now, Saint Augustine. By Summer Bozeman. By Summer Bozeman. It's got my name cool. on the cover and everything. Check it out. And I don't remember what page it is, but there is um, a, a page in there of the the courtyard outside of the what is now the Leitner Museum, where uh, my mom made it into one of the pictures. So that's a little Easter egg. See if you can see my mom. So I'm a recovering Yankee, and what I tell people is if they're going to come visit the southeast, they've got to hit Charleston, Savannah, St. Augustine. St. Augustine's great. Um, yeah, give a little, like, two-minute pitch on what's awesome about St. Augustine. Well, it Since is... Since you wrote the book. <laughs> I did write the book. It is the oldest continuously inhabited European settlement in North America. It has the oldest stone fort in North America. Um, it's never been conquered. 
the the city was burned a couple of times, but the people were safe in the fort. And um, the fort is made from coquina stone, which is a really porous, um, kind of a chalky stone. And as um, cannonballs were fired into it by James Oglethorpe of um, Georgia fame, um, they would just sink into the rock. It would just absorb the shock and didn't damage the walls. You know, you could just go and like pull the cannonballs out and shoot them back. And um, uh, so that's how the fort is still there today. Um, it's uh, a small, it's still a small town. Um, you know, it's got plenty of amenities. It's got lots of great hotels, super good restaurants. Um, but it still really feels like a, a really walkable, really beautiful um, Spanish style, Moorish style city. It's one of my favorites. Great beach too. Cool. So you've worked in a, you've worked in a number of industries. Um, what did you like about some of, I know you've worked in nonprofit, you've worked in travel and leisure. Um, what did you like about particular jobs you had? Now you're in corporate. Mm -hmm. Or I'm not sure, manufacturing? I'm not sure exactly what you call it. But anyway, what do you like about each one? What are some things you don't like about each industry now that you've kind of been through it? Well, um, let's see. I Just for you, for, for some context on the podcast, we're, ta we're talking to younger people who are possibly considering becoming a writer, mm -hmm. an author, a PR writer, you know, journalist. Mm -hmm. We're not sure. So mm -hmm. we're just giving advice pretty much. Well, um, I initially started working in, uh, in tourism, in travel PR. Um, one thing that I think is really great about working in tourism is the stories are always positive. You're always telling a journalist something really great about this place and why they need to go and why their readers are going to be interested. There's not a lot of crisis management to, to deal with. Um, uh, for a while, I was working for um, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, which is based in Miami but has uh, satellite offices in eight communities across the country, and uh, Macon is one of those. Um, the other cities are much bigger cities, Philadelphia, Akron, um, San Jose, where um, the amount of money that Knight Foundation is able to invest doesn't go as far as it goes in a small city like Macon. So um, being able to work for an organization that is consciously making an impact to improve lives was, I mean, super gratifying. Um, and then being in a place where that money goes a little bit farther than it does in Philadelphia, um, you can see the impact a little bit more. You can talk to the people who are getting broadband connectivity where they didn't have it before. You know, they're able to apply for jobs. They're in a time like this, you know, when kids are going to school virtually, they have to have broadband connectivity. And in a community like Macon, where um, just outside of the city is rural and um, there's not a lot of access to, to broadband or other things like that, um, it makes a big impact. Um, there's a lot of focus on libraries and libraries are one of the greatest resources I think any community can have. Um, so I, I really felt fulfilled working for Knight Foundation. The work was harder. Um, it was a lot more cerebral. And I felt like I was never the smartest person in the room, which is a good thing. You know, I felt like I was, I was maybe intimidated a lot, but I was learning so much, just hearing other people's conversations. Um, so that was a really great thing. Um, I also worked for Visit Savannah for a while and, um, Again, just getting to talk about Savannah all the time and share what I think is great about it. Um, I think being an effective communicator, um, being an effective media relations person, um, having an authenticity when you're talking about what you're promoting really goes a long way. People can tell when you really care about it. Um, they can tell when you're really making an effort versus, you know, you're just writing up your standard pitch and sending it to 50 journalists. Um, Currently, I'm working, I guess you would call it corporate, I'm working for an industrial engineering um, and construction firm. Does that cross over into technical writing, or is it still just PR? I'm, I'm really not doing a lot of technical writing. Um, we do have a whole engineering arm of the company. So, or like, mar marketing PR, too. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, most of what I'm doing 
is, I, I wouldn't really call it, it's really call it marketing. Um, I guess you could, you could call it PR if, um, I would be the media contact. Um, if there were a crisis, I would be the crisis communications manager. I'd be the point person. Um, I work directly for the CFO. So, you know, I would probably be in the background and she would, you know, be the spokesperson. Um, uh, most of what I'm doing is internal communications, you know, branding, um, it's, it's a business to business company. So there's not a whole lot of marketing or advertising. So, um, communicating with the staff and proofreading, uh, there's a lot of internal documents, um, for OSHA and that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of paperwork that has to be in order, um, especially in terms of safety. So, um, proofing and working with, um, the management team and the, the legal team to make sure that everything says what it's supposed to say and doesn't, you know, like low key say something else because words matter. So pretty, pretty diverse experience. So if, if somebody was just graduating college, obviously everyone needs writers, like everyone needs to tell stories and communicate what they do and reach clients, customers, other businesses, Mm -hmm tourists, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, if somebody's graduating in 2021 or, you know, let's remove COVID from it, but they're graduating. A lot of times they're probably interviewing with people who aren't writers. Mm-hmm. So how are they setting themselves apart as like, here's my work samples. And, um, you know, how are they determining which maybe what industry they want to go into or, mm-hmm. um, what's kind of some advice you have for people just starting out? I would stick with, I would go with authenticity. You know, it's important that you care about what you're trying to promote. Um, You know, whereas marketing is a little bit more uh, targeted, you know, with keywords and it's a little bit more technical. I think PR is about authenticity and relationships. Um, Your your audience is journalists, not consumer. So um, journalists have a specific language that they speak. And your currency is going to be your relationships with those journalists. So when they're looking for something to write about, you know, they're not just going to go on the internet and Google it. They're going to go into their contact list and be like, you know what, that girl has given me some good story material before. I'm just going to email her and see what's going on with that. Um, If you have a positive relationship, then that's going to be invaluable to you. If they come to you instead of you having to convince them, um, that's worth its weight in gold. Are you naturally a people person that you can forge those relationships? Or did you, as a only child that read a lot and stayed home by yourself a lot, did you have to develop that? Um, I'm not a super social person. Like, um, my least favorite thing ever is having to go to an event and work the room. Um, I don't like networking. You know, I don't like going and introducing and, like, cold calling, you know, cold conversations. But... I, I do think I'm a very empathetic and emotional person, so I can bond with people pretty easily. We start talking about anything, and I can come up with an emotional response that you're going to feel is authentic because it is. Um, so I think it's really important that you believe in whatever you're trying to promote, Um, that you believe the story you're trying to tell is a really cool story because journalists are discerning people. They're no nonsense people. They're going to feel it from you. They're going to hear it in your voice. They're going to read it in your pitch. Um, I think it's really important to be 100% there. Um, so what would be like the ultimate dream? like the ultimate job because i know you love history you Mm -hmm. love cheerleading you love music there's a Mm -hmm. lot you can do you're very talented you're you're, you connect with people so um what would kind of be the thing that ties all those things together or are you still figuring that out i'm still figuring that Mm -hmm. out and i don't know if you ever stop figuring that out do you i don't know um i know um that if i had you know like five job offers right now the one that I would go with would be more in the range of philanthropy or advocacy or policy development. I'm becoming a really big, boring policy nerd right now. I've been reading a lot of like position papers and um, 
printing all kinds of stuff from like the Center for Popular Democracy's website. I'm reading this book about um, how the um, the drug business is structured and um, approaches uh, to disrupting the drug business that are economic rather than law enforcement, um, which might be really dry for some people, but I think it's really really interesting. I think policy is um, uh, what drives all the little things that we don't really think about in our lives. So, um, you know, I love when we talk about, I know you love when we talk about policy. (laughs) Um, but I would personally lean more towards policy or advocacy or philanthropy or something where I can see that impact, um, of my work. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to talk about Savannah and say, this is, this is a really great place to visit and then see, my idea in print and then see people actually coming and spending their money here and, you know, supporting a local economy. That's certainly fulfilling. But, um, I think if I were to choose anything, I would like to go with something a little bit more philanthropic. Um, we mentioned authors and journalists. Are there any podcasts? I know you're a big podcast listener. So what what do you listen to? Um, I've been listening to a lot of crooked media podcasts been listening to what a day um which i really like because it's bite-sized like i um uh work in like an industrial area where there aren't a lot of sit-down restaurants so i go and i pick up some lunch and i go to a park and i sit by the pond and i listen to like my 30 minute podcast and it's perfect for lunch break um i've also been listening to uh pod save america which is kind of the gold standard in political podcasts, um, but it's a little bit longer. I can't listen to a whole episode on one lunch break, so it takes me like two lunch breaks to listen to it. Um, I also really like true crime podcasts. Um, True Crime Garage is a good one. Uh, And I've kind of been, I have a long list of podcasts that I've been meaning to check out that I haven't yet. It's just, there's just too much. It's too much media, she said sarcastically. Yeah, we talk a decent amount on the show about um, the your consumption of media as well as your creation. And, you know, it's good to see what else is out there. And mm-hmm. uh, for me, then how can I do the show better? Right. So um, are you open to people connecting with you? Of course. I um, would be very happy to chit-chat about history or policy or whatever, podcasts. How do people find you? I am on Twitter at Summer Bozeman, S-U-M-M-E-R-B-O-Z-E-M-A-N. So uh, put right there, probably, or down, <laughs> or down below. Uh, and on Instagram, I am Hi Summer Was Here. Cool. And then uh, you have a website, too. I do. Um, thank you for remembering. Uh, my website is summerbozeman.com, and I have um, some pieces that I've written up there, and... Um, uh, press releases and essays and just all kinds of crazy stuff. Cool. Well, thank you for coming on the pod. Thank um, you so much for having me. For in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to more creative professionals and uh, artists and entrepreneurs to discover the truth about how to be successful in their creative career to give you advice um hope you enjoyed this episode if you have suggestions for the podcast or guests you can send uh, them to we at gmail.com uh you can listen to us on all of your favorite podcast platforms don't forget to leave us a good review or if you're watching on youtube you can like share and subscribe and you can learn more at creative-truth.com and we have a swag store so if you want to get a hat it's up there it's live I'm so, going to get a mug. Yeah, you got to. We have mugs. Mm-hmm. So thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next one.